Good morning, human beings. Isn't it great to be able to say that? Seeing one another more as things start opening up. Great to see so many people here this morning as well. Well, last week, Martin uh, kicked off our new series from Exodus with a superb message about standing up to the pharaohs of life. Based on that story in Exodus chapter 1, where the Israelites had been so blessed by God and had so grown that Pharaoh had become threatened by this immigrant group of people within his nation and so had ordered the midwives to kill at birth every Israelite baby boy that was born. And we saw how the midwives feared God rather than obeyed Pharaoh. Now chapter 2 of Exodus goes on to focus in on just one of those baby boys who escaped that, uh, the character of Moses. Chapter 2 has the miraculous way that God uh, protected him. Now, we aren't going to look at that chapter today, but we do just want to skim over it to set in context what we are going to look at. And actually, there's a great summary in Acts chapter 7 where Peter gives his sermon before his martyrdom and gives a bit of an overview of Israel's history. So let's just read a little bit from his message that will help us see what chapter 2 was all about. So from Acts 7.20 we read this, at that time Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for by his family And when he was placed outside, and many of you will remember how that was done, you remember, hidden in a little basket, hidden among the reeds by the Nile, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Now, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites, He saw one of them being ill-treated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them by saying, men, you're brothers, why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was ill-treating the other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? You thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And when Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. And after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Now, I hope you noticed that there were two little uh, time periods highlighted in those readings in red. And if you've done the math, you should be able to tell me now how old Moses is by the time we pick up the story here. And normally I'd have you shouting it out, but we can't today, but you're an intelligent bunch. And I'm sure the answer you would have come up with is that he is now 80. Moses has spent the first 40 years of his life learning how great he was, being brought up as an Egyptian prince in the royal palaces. He's then spent the next 40 years of his life learning how insignificant he was, living as a tent-dwelling shepherd in the backwaters of Midian in the desert there. Interesting, isn't it? Both of those would provide him with skills that he would need in this next phase that's about to begin. As a young prince, he would have learned, oh, useful skills that will come in later, like reading, writing, leadership, warfare. As a shepherd in the desert, he would have learned about how to survive in difficult terrain, just want to say in passing friends, never underestimate the purposefulness down the road of what God is taking you through right now. Never underestimate the purposefulness 
down the road of what God is taking you through right now. Because all of those things God would use in Moses' life. In the third segment of his life, the final 40-year segment, where he would learn not how great he was or how insignificant he was, but the third segment of his life was all characterized by learning how great God was. And yet, he could so easily have missed it. Which is why the title for our second talk in this series today is Missing the Moment or Meeting with God. So now let's read our reading for today from Exodus chapter 3 and look at this passage that we're going to pick up from that point where Stephen left his summary. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush doesn't burn up. And when the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you were standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Life as a shepherd in the wilderness of Midian in the Sinai Peninsula Peninsula was, was not an easy life. Um, you were constantly on the move, looking for pasture, looking for water for your flock. And so it just happened to be that that particular day, Moses was taking his flock to the region near Mount Horeb, where he has this encounter with God that would change his life. And yet, do you know what? It started out really as quite so ordinary. So ordinary, it actually would have been really easy to miss it. You see, if you and I were driving down the A66 and we suddenly saw a bush alongside the road burst into flame next to our car, you know, I imagine there would be a slight, ooh, maybe even a, ah! But it would be really, really unusual, wouldn't it, for us? But seeing a bush burst into flames in that part of the world wasn't unusual at all. The temperatures there regularly reach mid-40s centigrade. And we know from what we've seen on TV, haven't we, in places like Australia and California, when you get long, dry spells of heat and no rain, how very often you do get bushes spontaneously combusting, catching fire. So to see a bush catching fire like Moses did that day wasn't particularly 
unusual. And yet, and yet there was, there was something about that bush that day that made it a bit different. Because it burnt. And it burnt. And it burnt. And it burnt. <laughs> and the flames just wouldn't go out. And so Moses, no doubt, scratching his head, says, oh, I'll go over to this bush and see this strange sight. See why the bush does not burn up. And as he did, he found his life changed forever. Because in that, to him, very ordinary burning bush, he found a very unordinary God. A God who Moses discovered three quick things here. would just come up on the screen. He discovered that day a God who knows us. A God who confronts us and a God who sends us. Let's just think about each of those briefly. A God who knows us. Moses, Moses, God called. Now, one of the things about getting older is that you start to forget people's names. Uh, even people's names that you know really well, like, Thingamy, who was leading the meeting earlier. Um, anybody, any of the older folk here experienced that? Yeah, one or two hands going up there. But I want to say this to you this morning. God never forgets a name. He never forgets a name. And while Moses might have run from Egypt to get away from everything, he could not run and get away from God. Because wherever you run, God runs there with you and knows you by name. Guys, take encouragement today that whether we're here in the building or watching online, God knows every one of us by name. Even, especially, those of you who've been running from him. Those of you who've been weaving here and there, thinking you can get away. Those who've been ducking and diving from God. He knows you by name and even today he is calling you by name. And he's waiting for that simple response that says, yeah, that's me. Here I am. Whether that is for the first time ever in your life. Maybe you've been thinking about God recently and you've got this increasing sense that God is after you. Well, I've got news for you. He is. But he's after you because he loves you. And he wants to come and fill and transform your life. He knows you by name today. And even those of us that have walked with God for many years, you know, maybe you're going through something at the moment and you're thinking, you know, is God here? Does he remember me? God remembers you. God knows you by name. Be encouraged by that today. Second, he's not only a God who knows us, he's a God who confronts us. He tells Moses to take off his sandals as a mark of respect because he's standing on holy ground. Why? Because God has turned up. And what Moses needed to know was that he couldn't be used by God until he'd been confronted by God. By that I mean until he had realized who God was and how big God was and in particular that God was bigger than Pharaoh as Martin was sharing with us last week. Because shortly he was going to have to go back to Pharaoh and this little old guy was going to have to confront one of the most powerful men on earth at that time and he needed to know that his God was bigger. Friends, our God is always bigger, amen, than whatever or whoever we are facing. Yet we will never confront the pharaohs in our life unless we've taken our shoes off and acknowledge, God, there is no one bigger than you. Not even this person, not even this issue, 
that I am facing. I wonder, have some of us let our issues, our pharaohs, get bigger than our God? If so, take your shoes off this morning, as it were, and acknowledge him again. A God who knows us, a God who confronts us, third, a God who sends us. God reveals himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, his ancestors. Why does he do that? Because he was reminding Moses that he is a God who is faithful to his promises. He had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now he was about to start fulfilling them. He always does. When God has made a promise, he always fulfills it. I love the, the verbs that follow in this section. Just take a look at these. He says that he has seen and heard, and I think it's going to come up in just a moment, hopefully, seen and heard and am concerned and have come down. God still does this whenever we call out to him. God is neither distant nor deaf. I loved that spoken word that Rita had. You are still God. And that's what Moses needed reminding of that day. He's still God. And yes, sometimes we have to go through some of those meanwhiles that Martin spoke about recently. But he's always God and he is always faithful to his promises. And he always sees and hears and is concerned and comes down when we cry out to him. Never doubt it. And now this God, this big God, the one who is still God, who's about to fulfill his promises, says to this 80-year-old guy who, let's face it, probably thought, I've probably not got much longer now. Maybe a few years if I'm lucky. But he was probably thinking he was getting to the end. But God says to this 80-year-old guy, old folk, don't write yourself off, please. Never underestimate what God still might want to do through you. He says to this 80-year-old guy, all of those promises I made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I'm now going to start bringing to pass through you. Go, I'm sending you, he says in verse 10. I will be with you in verse 12. And so the greatest adventure of Moses' life begins. And all because he stopped at a burning bush. I was thinking earlier this week, imagine what would have happened if he hadn't stopped at the burning bush. Well, there would have been no being sent to Pharaoh, no miraculous escape for the Israelites from slavery, no crossing of the Red Sea, no going through the wilderness, no receiving of the law and the tabernacle, no journey to the promised land, no entering the promised land, no taking of the promised land, no Davidic king from whom the Messiah would come, no Messiah, no Jesus, no church, no us. Tell you what, we got a lot to thank that burning bush for. And even more to thank the guy who took the time to stop at that burning bush and had an encounter with God. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but the first seven verses of our reading today are packed with very similar words. Let's just take a look at that slide, please. I've just highlighted them there for you in yellow. And although they're slightly different words in English, in the Hebrew, they're exactly the same root word. Saw, see, sight, look, look. And it struck me this week, that's an awful lot of looking and an awful lot of seeing. And the trouble is with us in life is that so often we get so busy that we don't do what Moses did. We don't take time to stop and to look. And look and look 
until we've really seen what God wants to say to us in a particular situation. Moses stopped and looked that day because there, there was something about that burning bush. And frankly, he didn't even know what it was. It was burning and burning and burning and burning and burning. Maybe it was a new type of wood there in the wilderness. He didn't know, but he thought, I'm going to go and have a look at this thing. He took time to stop and to look because there was something but he didn't know what. But he kept looking and he kept seeing until he found. You know, I think the lesson out of this for us today is that we really need to learn to stop and look and listen and pursue those moments when they come into our life so that we don't miss what God might want to say to us that day. Now, the reality is uh, such moments are very unlikely to come in the shape of a burning bush as you drive down the A66. They're far more likely to come as little nudges, little thoughts, little prompts, little niggles. And the challenge to us is, what as God's people will we do on those days when those little things come? Will we miss the moment? Will we do what Moses did, meet with God? I thought perhaps the easiest way of trying to unpack this uh, is to give you a couple of examples from my own life uh, of the sort of thing I'm thinking of to help you Try and do this yourself this week. Um, here's one from our own life uh, through circumstances. As I was coming up to, towards retirement, uh, working in our churches in Oxfordshire, uh, I had the privilege of having a three-month sabbatical. And Liz and I went to Regent College in Vancouver, uh, Canada, beautiful place, uh, I did lots of study there, but we also got involved with the local, with a local church there. Uh, and in particular, I built up quite a good relationship with the pastor there. And I'll never forget that just a few days before the end of our time there, I think it was only something like three or four days before we were due to return to the UK, I, w I was out with him on one occasion and we were chatting and he suddenly said to me out of the blue, why don't you come back for a year and mentor me? And the first thing I did, like any good godly man of God, was to laugh. And he said to me, no, I'm serious. And at that moment, a bush caught light. I can remember still, I can visualize it now, I can see where I was sitting, how he was sitting, what he said. And just out of that sentence, no, I'm serious, something caught light in me that at that moment simply said, ooh, I wonder if God is in that. Stroke, I think God might be in that. I wasn't even sure at that moment particularly when I went back and shared this with Liz, who said, well, if you're coming back, you're coming back on your own. <laughs> I need to explain um, that there is a lot of rain in Vancouver. We were there in the rainy season at that time. It's really in a, a, a rainforest. Uh, and Liz has arthritis, and rain and arthritis don't always go well together, so that was the rationale behind it. But once she got over that, we thought, well... <laughs> If it was a burning bush, we do need to pray. And so we started to pray about it together. And as we did, we found that that burning bush burnt and burnt and burnt and burnt. And guess what? We ended up going back to Vancouver for nine months where we got involved in the church and where I mentored that pastor. Unless you think that I am the spiritual one, uh, there was another occasion in our life where Liz got the burning bush 
when I was invited to go and act as principal at a seminary in India uh, for three months to give a friend of mine just a break. He was exhausted and I laughed at him. And uh, I came back and told Liz and I said, I think it was something like, there is no way I am doing this. And it was Liz who got the burning bush at that point and who said, do you know what? I think this could be a great adventure for us. And out of that, that was my prompt to stop at the burning bush with her and to start looking. Throw out invitations, throw out questions. Here's a different example from scripture. Um, Those of you who are regular members here will know that our daughter in America was diagnosed with uh, cancer. I think it was 18 months ago now. Uh, We were pretty devastated and when I'm praying for something, I need a scripture to stand firm on. And I just happened to be reading through the book of Isaiah at that time. Really commend to you steadily reading through God's word. It is a great way to open up your heart to what God might want to say on any day. And that particular day, I was calling out to God and saying, God, I just don't know how to pray for my beloved daughter. And that particular day, I got to the passage in Isaiah 37 where Isaiah is prophesying over the king of Assyria who was attacking Jerusalem. And God said about that king, I will put a hook in my nose and my bit in your mouth and I will make you return by the way that you came. And at that moment, a bush caught light. And I thought, that's the one, that's the verse I am going to speak into the cancer that is in Becky's life. And I've prayed that prayer almost daily ever since. A couple of examples there, one from circumstances, one from scripture. Last quick one from an event. Um, Again, I've told this story before of how Liz and I had to go one day to be with parents in a delivery suite where the mother had just delivered a dead baby and she had known for some months that the baby would be dead by the time it was born, but she felt that God wanted her to provide a safe place for that baby and to deliver it into this world. And I thought, dear God, what on earth am I going to say to parents who have just delivered a dead child and as we walked from the waiting room where we were just outside that delivery suite the nurse came to the door and said they're ready for you now literally moments after the birth and as I walked towards that door there on the white tiled floor was a rubber band pristine everywhere else but this rubber band and a bush caught fire and something said pick it up and I Picked it up, didn't know why, slipped it on my wrist, took it in, took this sad story through, prayed for the baby and suddenly the bush kept burning and burning and I took the rubber band off my ring and said to the mother, God says to you, where does this rubber band begin and end? And the mother said, nowhere. And I simply said to her, so is God's love to you. And she took the rubber band, put it on her wrist. And for the next several weeks, she she ached so much inside, she, she couldn't get words out to pray. But what she did for those next few weeks was this with the rubber band. That was her prayer. It was like she was saying, I can't say the words, God, but I believe it. I believe it, I believe it. And she got through that because of a rubber band. Because of a burning bush that just caught my attention enough to think I wonder. So friends, as we finish, how about you? Have you let life get so full, so busy, that you don't have any time to see any burning bushes, let alone stop at them? I want to encourage you this week to look out for those burning bushes in life. Look out for those little moments when there's a nudge, a thought, a niggle, a wonder, a should I phone, should I? Look out for those and dare to believe that these are moments that God could take. They are junctions on the journey. Don't rush on from them. 
Stop like Moses did. And pray and say, God, what might you be saying or what might you be wanting to do through this? The one who is still God. Let's not miss our moments this week. Let's stop, look, listen, meet with God and all of us be sent on our own individual journeys with him this week. God bless you.